All right, everybody, we are back. We have a very special guest. And in this episode, we are going to Australia. Our special guest is somebody that was a part of the Red Army, was a child soldier, part of the SPLM, SPLA when he was a teenager. When he got older, he went to Australia. And when he went to Australia, he didn't forget his roots. He did. He promoted our culture and language. He is a former executive producer of SBS Dinka. At SBS Dinka, he wrote stories, did programs in the Dinka language, trying to encourage the use of Dinka language to the people in the diaspora. And now he's a host of Diverse Views, trying to create conversations with South Sudanese in the diaspora and at home about how we can make our country better. We have no other than Ajak Deng Chenko. My brother, you are welcome. Thank you for joining us on South Sudan in the World. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I call and uh, looking forward to have a conversation with you and answer some of your questions. But uh, I want to thank you first, a young person with uh, determination. And because not, not most of your age are interested in public uh, service and things to do with uh, our community and our society. And uh, thank you also for going back home and you will learn a lot. Seven years, you learning a lot. So thank you. All right. Thank you so much. So uh, let's talk about your background. Uh, many people your age grew up in such a harsh environment during the SPLA, SPLM movement. Tell us where you were born and your upbringing. Thank you. First of all, I was born in uh, one village called Adol. And uh, Adol is part of uh, Kolnyang Payam, currently uh, Boer County. And by 1982, I was born in the village, and that was after my family that first came to Juba in 1960s, went back, uh, the, the first war in, that ended in 1972. So I was born in the village, but then moved to Juba briefly. I was stationed in Tongpeng, but when the war started in 1983, my mother came and took me back to with my sister. So we went back to the village and I was there in the village and went to the cattle camp from 1983 or maybe early 84 to, to 1990. But uh, when Bor was captured from the Sudanese army in 1989, April, uh, my father thought that it would be very good uh, to go to school. So I started my classes in Bor in 1989, that was when I started class one. And by that time, some of my brothers have already joined the SPLA. One was already part of Jamos Battalion, and the other one uh, went to, to Finyadu in 1987. So among the boys, we were four. So one of them was in Juba, and I was the only one left home. So in 1990, a new call came in that uh, new Jej Ahmed has to go to, to a new place. We were not told of where, where is that. So a large number of us moved from Bor. Uh, most of us were predominantly from Bor and Twitches and then Nyarwing and all. Uh, the first 1,000 or less than 1,000 of us trek from Bor, from our villages to Bor and then from Bor. We travel, some of us travel by the trek after Jameza. We were assisted with maybe as one of the SPLA trucks, just few of us, to Mangala, and then the rest woke up to up to Mangala. And then by that time, we got a car. Then we got different uh, UN cars that took us to Torit. By December 18, Polataka was established in eastern Equatoria, Mogui County. And that's where we were moving to. So we formed uh, the first, they called them uh, Sriat, or the, that is, uh, different units, military terms. We were young, but uh, in 1991, we were joined by another group of young men from Nuba Mountain. And by that time, Ethiopia was already, the government of Ethiopia was toppled. So the Jeje Hammer from Dima and Finyudu were moving out. So some of them joined us in, in Polotaka. So I was in Polotaka until early 1992 and then left, went to a displaced camp called Ame, where the the victims of the 1991 split from board were being uh, internally uh, held as uh, members of the displaced community. So that's where I was, and then travel around, around South Sudan from 19 was between Pagari, Kaya, and then Mangalatoria. And then by 1995, I moved to Eastern Equatoria, New Kuch, where I stayed from 1995 to 1998. So that's the brief story that I can give you. And then from 1998, I was doing a lot of things to do with the, with the community. I was involved as a teenager. I was a 
food distributor, and there was something called SASCOM. And SASCOM was, was the idea that came, you know, the United Nations was providing food to the SPL, to, to the displaced camp. But we have to be clever enough on how to feed SPLA. So we have to inflate numbers and create something that was not known to the UN. Then we will have to supply some food to, 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 <laughs> to, the SP, to the SPLA. So we did that because there was no other way SPLA can survive. And in 96, April of 96, I was recruited by Diocese of Torita as an auxiliary nurse to help with the in primary health care system. I worked there for two, three years. And 98, I attended teacher's training college. Went to Pochala, 15 of us. We went and opened 70 schools. It all wow, more than wow. 7,000 kids in uh, Anua. And then from there, I moved back. I came back in 1999 to visit my family who moved to Kakuma then. But my mother came and said, look, it's time for you to go to school. You're not going back to, to South Sudan. And I said, no, I have to. But they say no. So I said, okay. I started working in Kakuma Refugee Hospital and during at night and going to school at, at daytime. So, and then from then, one year in Kakuma, but came to then came to Nairobi, joined group of young people. We became activists. We were the people yelling, traveling to Machakos and then to Naivasha with the support, supporting the SPLM peace negotiation. So we were going to Naivasha when they go moved to Nanyuki, uh, when the talks collapsed, when they went to Nakuru again and then from Nakuru now they moved to Naivasha. We were the, the youth that would uh, travel there every weekend to go ahead and yell uh, <laughs> at, at the politicians. We need peace. So until the 31st of December 2004, when peace agreement was signed, officially ended, and then the 9th of January was the grand, the grand celebration and the formal uh, signature. But the actual signing ceremony took place on the, on the 31st when Omar Hassan al-Bashir came, the former president of South Africa too, Thabo Mbeki, and Dr. John Garang. That was... You were there? I was there. How was the experience like seeing peace come? It was very interesting, Akol, because that was the first time for us to see Omar Hassan al-Bashir. You know, when he took over in 1989, that was the brutal time in South Sudan. You know, this is the time that the Mujahideen started to, to come to South Sudan. This was the time that the anti bomb, uh, bombardment become very worse. So some of us have got the, the worst memories of witnessing somebody being killed by a bombardment. And at that moment, we were joking with one of my friends. His name is Kola Lankwal, who later, he died here in Australia. We were joking, we were saying, what, what will be our reaction if Omar Hassan or Rashid come here? Do we have to hate him? Or do we have to, to celebrate him as a president of Sudan? Then we convince ourselves later and say, look, if John Grant can embrace him, and this is the man who was fighting with him, then we better give peace a chance. We, we were, by the time Omar Hassan al-Bashir came to Simbaloj, we were not enemies. We were there to celebrate the peace agreement. And that's what happened. I think people like Vice President Waniga were, were, were there. People like Michael Mack, we were negotiators, uh, Nyaldeng Nyal and the rest. So, that evening, we end up celebrating, and we went back to Nairobi uh, very joyous. We could not wait for the, the, for the 9th of, uh, of January for the grand celebration. And I became involved with the, you know, by that time, there was a need to prepare people to go and do some cultural dances. So I actually prepared the boar uh, dances uh, to, to go, and uh, it took me nine days to train them <laughs> to, to be part of that. So that's what I, I witnessed that. And then we celebrated. It was a joyous moment. You would be shocked when, when we went to Nyaya Stadium. The Arabs, the, South, the North Sudanese, they could not shy away from South Sudanese. They were there dancing with their hima on and everything. They were just jumping in. And so by that time, everybody won peace. And uh, I was shocked that the North Sudanese were in need of peace, like us. So mm -hmm. that day was a joyous day for the Sudanese people at large. It was not only about for South Sudanese. And that's what I witnessed. And also, soon after, we lost Dr. John Garang. I was among the people who went and buried him, actually. Oh, wow. Really? Yes. Our plane touched down on the 6th of uh, August at Juba International Airport. I actually have the photo of the grave of Dr. John Grang and how many, the metal that have been put down, the, the tile in the grave. 
So I was there. I uh, paid my last respect to him. And from there, you have a unique background. You went to Australia before all of this. Before I went to Australia, I went back to, in October after the government was formed, I went back to, to South Sudan. I worked with Michael McQuay when he was the Minister of uh, Legal Affairs and Constitutional Development as his office manager. Okay. I worked with him for seven months. But by that time, I... My wife has come to Australia and I thought that, look, uh, I have a young family and if there is a way that I can go and see them and then I have to make a choice of either looking after my family or looking after money, if I were to get good money. I first went to U.S. I visited U.S. in 2006, came back to Juba, but in July of two, in, on the 1st of August 2006, I moved to Australia. I thought I would come for a month to go back and then just come and spend time to see my daughter and then go back. And then I, I made the choice to, to stay with my family and then say, look, I have to do something. I have to stay here. And that's what happened. So I was here for the first six months without a proper job. And then after six months, I went into community development. I was working with the youth, came and went through some training, was trained as a Parenting across cultures, uh, a facilitator. So for two years, I was working with families. I was training thirty families every thirteen weeks. Was it for South Sudanese or all nationalities? Uh, South Sudanese before uh, at the beginning, but later I extended it to the Apagani community. I was doing that to to the Afghanistan community because it was a comprehensive. Uh, uh, program. I was trained by one of American, African American, her name was called Dr. Marilyn Steele from California. Uh, one thing that we were trying to tackle is the issue of parenting for, for the migrants that came outside Australia from other cultures. And because she was telling us, you will face challenges and you need to understand way of life in Western world, challenges that will come. And you must be prepared and take the concept of it, take a village uh, to raise a child to, in order to bring up uh, some of these African kids here. So I took that on and when did well. But you know, you know, being, uh, you know what people uh, are called by. By that time, I was not holding any degree. <laughs> I have those basic training and there is always an idea of saying, oh, he's talking to us, but he's not educated. Yeah. <laughs> Despite everything that you have done and you have not been to the university, people will think that, oh, no, I've been to colleges, I've done some courses, and they say, no, 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 no. He's not even been educated. I don't think he's the right person to talk to us. That is the, my <laughs> age. <laughs> that is my age. Even though they didn't know you had the training. It, no, they care less. You, are, you, you have to understand, you know, being, yeah, they were saying, he's not educated. We, so what I did was that I said, look, I'm, I'm more into technology and I may not, you know, media is a passion to me. You know, I, I started taking pictures in 1996. I bought my first camera in 1996, in June of 1996. So I've always, I've always been interested in media and I've done a lot of, uh, to do with media. I don't need a training with it. I've been doing pictures. I've been doing videos before I even went to any course. Also, I'm passionate with Dinka language. I actually, when I was in class four, English class four, I was already a Dinka teacher. I started my classes in 1994. And some of my students are there with you in Juba. How did you learn to read and write? Somebody called, it is funny. <laughs> and how many people don't believe that D Dinka people can read and write English? You can do it. I was taught by by one of my church teachers, and but by, by 1993 and early 1994, somebody called Joseph Dinda uh, expanded on that. He was teach, uh, giving me all the books that were written. Take example, Dinka Bor uh, dialect was translated in in early 1920s, and the first Bible was uh, published in 1934, and then later published in 1940. That gave the base of what you can do. And then later, I was taught the alphabet. And when you are taught the alphabet, automatically now you know, when you understand the alphabet and you understand the use of alphabet properly, you then now use the language that you speak and put it into 
into writing. That's where, so by that time, I've come to the understanding that, look, Dinka is uh, something that I need to know. So by 1994, I started the interest in it. I was writing songs in Dinka and just lyrics, writing down. I will always practice. So when I came to Australia, I thought of what would be the best way to, to keep promoting this language. So I would just translate government documents by that time, and it was not big. But uh, when I went back to school, I thought, look, I have to do what I like. And what I liked by then was uh, to do with multimedia, not as media. So what I mm-hmm. did was that I went, I went back to school to do information technology. Oh. So, so I did a diploma uh, uh he had a diploma in, uh, in uh, I don't know whether in America, here they call uh, anything after high school is a diploma here. In America, you call a high school diploma. High school diploma? Yeah, a diploma here is next to the degree. So what we did was, what I did, I went and did uh, software development and uh, software development and a bit of software uh, engineering and then web development. So I did a diploma in that. And by that time, I then went and enrolled to, to the university and did a, a computer networking. Alongside that, I was practicing uh, media by recording interviews and uh, writing about and blogging at that time. I used to blog and I used to write maybe articles. Even some of my article used to be on Sudan Tribune, I think in 2007, 2008. Oh, okay. And I was not, I never knew that I will have uh, to, and I will interview people, record them and keep them. So then in 2011, the, there was a census in Australia and the number of Dinka speakers uh, grew. I was one of the translators to SBS because there is a, there's a, there's an agency within SBS called In Language. So they do commercial and they do document translation for the government. But then there is a media section. So by 2012, I think the management of SBS realized that among the African languages, Dinka got the the highest population. There were by that time there were more than uh, ten thousand Dinka speakers across Australia. And it is one of the communities with the high needs. So they introduced, SBS is a public broadcaster in Australia. It's part, is like the, the PBS in America. Okay. It, is, it is the equivalent of NPR or the PBS. Okay. So what they did was that, so it is an, there are two Australian public broadcasters. The ABC, which deal with news in English only. But SBS broadcasts in other languages. in more than it was established in 1975. So it uh, uh, broadcast in European languages, Asian languages. But in 2012 and 2012 and early 2013, they now started to introduce African languages to the, to the radio. So Amharic, uh, Dinka, Somali, and uh, Kiswahili and, uh, and Tigrinya were introduced. And they have to recruit uh, the producers for these programs. So SBS Dinka position was advertised. And the qualification was that you must have multimedia background. We're writing, you, are, you understand, you can write news from Dinka to English and from English to Dinka. I was alert and I applied. And a lot of other people applied. And I got the job as a SBS uh, executive producer. And I was calling to the role on the, I went, I started with them on July 8th. That's when I started and I was being given the orientation. And by the August 3rd, 2013, that's when I started broadcasting for, for SBS Dinka. That's when I, so I started broadcasting on the 3rd of August, uh, 2013. How was the response? Because I think there's a challenge to people living in the diaspora, to culture, and many elders go to there with the language and the culture. I mean, how was the reception from the people of the community? The reception from the the community, especially the elders, uh, you look at the you know you look at the the audience profile of the of the elders. 
is that they are more interested in what is happening back home. They are more interested in their in their language. So they were so excited. They were so happy. They they appreciate that this was coming. So we went well. <laughs> we went well from August, you know, and by uh, from August, but things changed. You know, August third. Already, the government of South Sudan was dissolved on the twenty, on the twenty third of uh, of July. So I have already I have started in the middle of uh, political turmoil back home. So I have to make a decision of saying, okay, can I ignore what is happening back home, or do I need to to cover the stories from uh, back home? And if I am going to cover them, will I be safe? That was the thing that I have to make. And I said, okay, I have to risk this. That's when I started now tapping into into the inter- political interviews in August mm-hmm. of 2000. And I did my <laughs> first interview before I went to, before I went, uh, start broadcasting. I did the first interview on uh, on the 26th. And that's when, 26th of July. And that's when I interviewed Kuala Manyang. Yes, I remember that. You interviewed a lot of people. I remember you interviewed the former U.S. ambassador, uh, South Sudan ambassador to the U.S., uh, Mr. Uh, Bach Valentino. I so, did. You know, I Bach, did. You know? In South Sudan, I've done over over one thousand interviews Pol- from politicians, activists, civil society members, uh, community elders, and these include the governors. Like uh, during the crisis of two thirteen, uh, two thirteen in Upper Nile area, uh, I remember when uh, Coco. And I, I have, I was live in one of the events where the attack was happening, and I was interviewing people there. I remember I have to talk to Tormun Bun by by that time before he was injured. Yes, uh, I have yes. to, I have to interview some politicians in Rueng. I've done that with the former chief of staff from my from my, my long hour one, uh, Jimmy Dodmai, Taba, uh, the the. Ghana Amum, uh, Riak, and uh, coming down to governors like uh, uh, Maturi Kyundol, uh, coming down to Akintonga Leo, uh, Gwen Panyang oh. of Jongle State, uh, Bonabag Bill, the list goes, uh, including Riak Machar. We have very contentious uh, two interviews. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, brother Jack, you have a couple of good things that you guys in Australia and you had to ignore things. You couldn't ignore things at home because you're doing this in the Danka language and people in Australia want to know what's happening at home. And so it's impossible for you to ignore what's happening at home. And also your audience isn't just people in Australia. There's people like us who are living in America in a different time zone, but we still tuned into the SBS Denka. And that put me into a, a big problem, uh, I, I call. There was a, a wrong perception because we were broadcasting in Dinka and we are, uh, and our people could not differentiate between the, the language and the people. People thought that mm. now that you are broadcasting in Dinka, it is for Dinka. And I was telling people, no, 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 no. We are a radio broadcasting in Dinka. And that means we can interview whoever is speaking other languages. As long as the producer can understand what they are saying, I will then come and translate that into Dinka. Yes. But the radio don't belong to the Dinka. So if you see me interviewing the Nuer, the radio belong to them too. When I'm interviewing the Sholo, radio belong to them too. And that I think the mistake many people make is that they think the Dinka language is just for the Dinka people. And if you broadcast it, you're targeting the Denka people. The language is for people who speak the Denka language. And another word for media is medium. It's like, I think another point of the issue we need to define things is what is a journalist? What's an analyst? What's a commentator? And because you have people who are just sensationalists, you have people who are journalists, you have people who are commentators, you have people who are analysts, and then you have people who go on there and show their opinion. I mean, if you ask a commentator, you have an opinion and your opinion is geared towards one side, that's not objective. You're going to be seen as you're promoting a particular side or you're promoting a particular cause. And this is not true. And sometimes this thing can create division amongst people. And this can get people to believe what you're saying is true, even though you're not somebody who's a journalist. Yeah, there are some of them, even 
some of my talents. I remember when I was talking to to Dr. Lemakol, and we have to we have few uh, uh, seconds to. I told him, look, let, speak your broken dink of hers before we because Lem is gifted, is fluent in Arabic, in Sholo, in and he understand Dinka. And I was mm-hmm. telling him, look, let's you better say some few words in Dinka. And that's the same thing with uh, with one of the former ministers. Uh, we uh, from the IO, and the reason you look at the the center of the problem at that time, and I don't want the perception to be created that because the war happening in South Sudan is that the the radio become the voice of the Dinka. I want the radio mm-hmm. to be heard as a center where you can come and verify what has been said somewhere, and and verify it in a, in a realistic terms. Whereby I will have to look for the 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 actual storytellers and people who who are the story makers and then bring them in. It is up to them to come and and somebody was calling me. Why do you ask my uncle that one? And I was telling him, okay, if you don't want me to ask your uncle that why, then you don't let your uncle be part of the public service. He's a minister of the of the government of South Sudan. And I was not talking to your uncle. I never asked him about his cows. I was asking him about the, how he manage uh, how he manage South Sudan is affairs. And he said, "You are rude." I said, "No, I'm not rude. I'm being realistic." So if you are not prepared and you want to intimidate a journalist, another funny thing is these are called somebody said, "Why are you always the the, the only person asking questions? Can you also add us and we want to ask questions?" And I said, "Okay, <laughs> do you listen to BBC?" Yes. When when is the last time you saw an audience asking questions during the interview, unless if it is a talkback, and the audience have and the the talent has been alert that we will have audience, and these audience are going to ask questions. You will be given your time, but if I'm interviewing as a journalist, is it because I speak Dinka? And then they were saying, "Oh, we thought that it was just our Dinka thing." Are you a real journalist? So why are you why why are you broadcasting in Dinka if you are a real journalist? I think the mistake many people make is that they think the Dinka language is just for the Dinka people. And if you broadcast it, you're targeting the Dinka people. The language is for people who speak the Dinka language. And another word for media is medium. And, and, and then the one thing that play a role uh, in, in changing people's perception to, to believe in one-way narrative is the the radio SPLA. You know, you are a kid, so you you were born after the radio SPLA, as mm-hmm. uh, was never existed. You know, radio SPLA was a propaganda radio. So what happened is that they will always talk about uh, what they have done, the damage that they have inflicted to to the enemy, and uh, what uh, Doctor John Grang says, and what uh, is this, and then nothing, everything about Omar Hassan Al Bashir was always bad. Or everything about Swara Dab or Sadi Almadi or uh, Yapar Mamani Mary. That that perception came back with people. So now when they when they say that, take example, when they say that a leader is going to be interviewed by Akol uh, they 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 want it. They want uh, they want only the mic, not Akol. They want to come and let Akol give the mic to the leader, and the leader now will say to his people, "I am now with Akol." But now listen to my message. So, and <laughs> the moment I call, come and say, but hold on there, can I ask? Then they will tell you, why are you interrupting him? What they don't know, you are not, the mic was not for that leader to just come and lecture. The journalists have a, an angle in which he want the story to be told. And, and, but this is a process whereby we have to train our, our people. And it is our role as journalists to also train people. Another perception that is changing now also, a call, a call is that anybody with a camera or anybody with a platform now is believed to be a journalist Yes, within yes. our community. So if you go with your camera and go and say, Minister Woye, you are the good journalist. <laughs> you, when you ask, yeah, when you ask questions, questions, no, 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 you are not a good arrogant, journalist. Arrogant. You are arrogant. Who so, you but you if are, you go you and are. say, Minister, Minister, so and so, uh, there is nobody doing a job like you. You are the best, and you are everything. Now you are the journalist that will be an, invited every now and then. You are not a journalist. 
you are not even an opinion uh, an opinionist you are just a person who want to survive you got a camera you need to be financed <laughs> and you, you you are not a journalist if you are a journalist you will be critical on uh, issues and because even you you will be part of his stories one day because if you don't ask the right question history will judge you i think another point of the issue we need to define things is what is a journalist what's an analyst what's a commentator and because you have people who are just sensationalists you have people who are journalists you have people who are commentators your people who are analysts and then you have people who go on there and show their opinion i mean if you ask a commentator you have an opinion and your opinion is geared towards one side that's not objective you're going to be seen as you're promoting a particular side or you're promoting a particular cause and this is not true and sometimes this thing can create division amongst people and this can get people to believe what you're saying is true even though you're not somebody who's a journalist no 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 they they also believe mm-hmm. as you put it what what happened is this you have mentioned something important take example uh, political analyst you know you know been a problem with uh, analytical presentation i was looking at uh, what are when you were presenting at uh, 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 the economic situation in sudan and and south sudan and how this countries are connected you know until when we separated people don't know yet we are yet to have a, a border that has been demarcated and defined to define that we are totally separate countries we are still connected by oil people are still living in uh, going from juba before khartoum uh, start to have war to seek medical assistance in in khartoum including the children of politicians Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that mean we are not North Korea and South Korea. Yeah. We are mm-hmm. we are we are enemies who whose our de- type of enmity is yet to be defined because yes. you yes. find that a, 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 a Sudanese a Sudanese businessman will apply to Juba and sleep in our hotel as he want because and even has so many businesses and even married in Khartoum. Khartoum and the politician never married in Khartoum. But also when they meet here, there's a there's one place here in Australia. There's one guy that we tease ourselves. He's a Jali. He's from the same community as Omar Hassan and Al Bashir. And during he is he's a North Sudanese. And during the referendum, I went and tell him, "Ya Kale, we are going to we are going to vote, and I'm going to reject you. I'm going to go my way." He he, he told me a funny thing. He said you will reject me by boat, but are you going to chase me away when I come to the shop? and we meet that we will i will still eat with you i will still joke with you do i care less and it was true he, he, that was a true story now i met him two weeks ago one week ago and he was saying ajak what has changed we we separated the country more than 10 years later i'm still playing with you i'm still joking with you now it is my problem i'm the one now in trouble because the north is in war but south now become even more better for us so when you look at the the way that we as south sudanis in a state of being more analytical about situation to understand that things that are bad now may turn out to be good later uh, when we went to analyze situation take example we the leading figures now are salva kir mayadi uh, lema kol and uh, dr yang machar the splm the splm ig the splm g10 and the rest if you go and sit now and have a, a talk show asking where is the alternative and then discuss the merits in which you saying how are we if, if kir was to allow everybody to be free today and we go into the election who will south sudan is uh, ele- elect as a president and why you will be considered somebody will say okay is young machar and you must speak like uh, that riak is the leader kir failas but when you say no i understand kir failas according to you but can we see what are what will make riak more more better than kir let's come and uh, and discuss that and then also the citizens in maban the citizen in uh, in reng area or reng take example now reng is home now to, to thousands of people that are fleeing the sudanese war the the citizen there are the one helping these uh, displaced people to settle now so this community is, is is burden they got a burden okay if you are going to say if you going to ask them later in 2024 elections will you vote for the government or is there an alternative opposition that you will vote for somebody will give you a honest opinion because if he's providing his own food to feed people that cannot be fed by the government or maybe the opposition is not very vocal enough 
to, to rally the support for these people, then that person may end up not having one of the two or uh, voting for. Uh, no, not even voting because they, he will say, no, 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 no. Kiro, or or Lema, call, I, I have none of them. So I will not be voting. The, you must give citizens this platform. And that was the reason why we went to war. And you must also give people who, are, who understand the situation, who are analysts, commentators, to talk. That is part of the civic education that will help the citizen to understand, okay, my analysis or my understanding of the situation was wrong here. But the way Akol presented uh, this case, I think I have to change my mind. I mean, so many people say, like, why do you have to defend uh, what's happening uh, uh, in Sudan? And I say, well, they're still our neighbors. We still have vested interests in Sudan. I mean, we won. We got our independence. And we, say, we can't say we hate them forever. I mean, now what they're going through is really impacting and affecting us. Even the innocent people, if you look at the, let us be realistic. What is common... Uh, between us and the Congolese. That is not uh, common uh, between us and the North Sudanese. There is nothing common between us and the Kenyans and, and the Ugandans and the, and, the, and the Congolese. We are more than 1,000 kilometers of border. More than 1,000 yeah. kilometers of border is starting from a wheel, going down to, to the Bulu Nile. In every, in each of these 1,000 kilometers of land, from the top of Abiyai going down, we are bordering Sudan. And in each, every community, whether you are starting from Panto, coming down to Reng, the person in Reng is more closer to Sudan than a person in, uh, in Kapoita. Yeah. Because yeah. that is, and, and, and we are not going for another 1,000 to 10,000 years, we are going to be that closer. The river, we, we, and, and that's why it is very important that we, 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 we develop a very good, close relationship with North Sudan. Without uh, the oil, it is the only country where we have river transport. And, and, and if we were to get uh, developmental uh, services, take example, anything coming out of Red Sea to Port Sudan, can then be transported from the river to Juba. You cannot transport anything from Uganda to, to Juba. So whoever, okay, you look at the ABA and uh, Awil and coming down to Alor Kurkot and then all the, uh, all the areas in, at the border. These people and these people need a good relationship with the, with the border, with the, with the Sudanese. Yes, yes. Because we have that connection. There is the Gat and uh, the Bagara have connection to, to the land of South Sudan. So one thing that we, it is time now to understand that, yes, we, we politically disagree with the regime, not the people of North Sudan. Mm -hmm. It was the regime. And this is where SPLM have to be very good in educating people about what. And then there is the issue of John Garan. Yes, they, they were. And not even that. Who are our neighbors? The, our neighbors are the Nubians, the Nubia, the, the, the Nubian, the Nuba mountains. Who stood with us during the 21 years of war? Who are our neighbors? Are the Angasin at the Blue Nile? Malika Gari is still there. So if somebody say, don't, 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 don't see them as our brothers, I think they, something is wrong. And that was the ideology. That's why Dr. John Graham was saying the idea of New Sudan was an option because people in the Eastern Sudan, in, uh, in uh, Bija areas, in Western Sudan, and in uh, the Nuba, in the Nuba, in the in the far north, were exactly suffering like the people of South Sudan. So that's why it was that uh, there was a collective uh, responsibility to topple the government in Khartoum and to ensure that there is a government in place that is offering services to all the corners of the of the Sudanese people, not the suppression. Suppression was not an option. Suppression only became an option when Omar Hassan al Bashir did not take. Un, uh, making unity attractive uh, exactly, exactly. as a responsibility. But it was not an objective of the SPLM, SPLA. SPLM would have not disagreed with Guy Tut because Guy Tut was a pro South Sudan independent. Um, Bona Malwal was a pro South Sudan independence. Why, SPLM never advocated for the suppression of the South. It was only accidental. So, yeah, so they, they, they need to understand that. <laughs> I mean, even when you talk about the issue of New Sudan, He's really talking about all the marginalized groups in Sudan. He's talking about the Nuba people. 
he's ta- he's talking about the people in Darfur and people all this. So when you talk about John Gooding, you have to know the history. He was somebody who had a, a support of guns amongst many people. And you find people in the Bija and the Nuba Mountains and there are four people who support John Gunning. So if you have to know, you can't claim to be an expert when you don't know the difference between the SPLM North and the Nuba Mountains. It's very important. That's why he's, he was the most welcome man on uh, uh, in the history of uh, Sudan. Even, and I was asking one of my uncles who is an SPLM, uh, I asked him, how did you guys fail to understand the vision of your own leader? And even when I even, not even that, even during the, the moment when people like uh, Uncle uh, Vice President uh, Waniga, he used to think SPLM or Kuma Betana. And then he will use this word. Uh, Zola Darium she must get your Yuma Bemchi must get Zola Darium Chicaniza. I am Chicaniza Yuma Yuma Lat. Oh, that is the secular Sudanese uh, city that mm-hmm. we want. Hmm. That's none of our business. <laughs> it wasn't, it is none of our business. It was then that's how when the prisoners of war that were uh, arrested, uh, that were uh, captured in Ye were then integrated into the community. And some of them were allowed to get married to the to Dinka girls. And these were prisoners of war who are Arabs and Darfurian, who are Nubian, who are whatsoever, who came as Mujahideen. They were integrated and they were told, look, you are in your country. Leave as you want. And uh, later when peace comes, you will be allowed back to go to your village. Some of them have not gone back now. Why? Because they have found the reason to, to leave. To stay. To stay there. You know, recently I was in, uh, in October, I was in Uganda, in northern Uganda. And I went to to a refugee camp in Kola Nyamazi. And there's a very big number of Sudanese refugees coming all the way through a wheel to Juba and then from Juba to, to, to northern Uganda. I went and visited them. Why? They Some of them don't only speak English. And the only people that they are relying upon them now are their brothers from the from the south. Go to, go to uh, Nyumazi and uh, some of the northern Ugandan uh, refugee camp. Who have the, 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 the biggest uh, shops? Are the Darfurian and, the, and some of the Nubians. Are they living as brothers? Do Ugandan even know the difference between them? No, they don't. They look the same. No, no. So one thing that has to, you know, because of lack of civic education, uh, I call uh, everything is changing. The ideology itself is changing. And if you look at uh, some of your generation now who are 30 year olds, in 2005, they were kids. Were kids? Yeah, they were kids. These are the kids now that you find in Juba. They are either into security services, they are either into police, or they are in the army. Now, without, without ideological schools or without historical uh, presentation to these kids, they will have to invent their own ideology of what South Sudan they want. So these are the, or you find them on social media, this, the, the, the same generation who know nothing about why people went to war. So then it will become now about his own supremacy. So if he's, Abil, if he's Dinkabor and he thinks that he's better than Abilia, so when the Dinkabor are the one ruling today, you will think that, why would I talk to with Abilia and we have done this, we have done this. Or you think that because they know nothing about the, the, the history of how the Abilang people have suffered and how they have struggled at the border, he will, not, mm-hmm. he, will, he, he, will not, he will not see you as a liberator. So you will tell only what, he's, what he understands. He will just come and say, oh, and uh, this is my story. And we were the liberators then. And this is what we have done. At the end of the day, that is where things become murky. So there is a need. There is a need of more education. It has really affected many people in South Sudan. You know, I think of how I had a conversation with one of my relatives and I said that the new generation of people coming from ages of 18 20 to 25 who were sent to grow in Cairo, Kampala, Nairobi, Addis Ababa, or some places in the U.S., Australia, they have a different exposure and different lifestyle that they've lived. I mean, you, for example, I have relatives of mine who went to Kampala or went to Nairobi. When they come to Juba, they see that, okay, you guys... 
have generators, the power cuts off. There's those developmental challenges that they see, and they don't really know these historical SPLM figures. They say, okay, who's John Gunn? Okay, you mean the guy in the money? You know, that's how they, they know them. So there's a new generation of people who don't know the history of our country, don't know the history of the South Sudan, and, you know, they, they don't know the ideological differences between John Garang and Durabi. But now that they don't see the historic nature of the SPLM, SPLA, and some of them look at uh, Sudan or Arabism or Islam as these are the people, but it was an ideological, you know. And if you look at some of the challenges, Turabi and Garang had an ideological difference. And this ideological difference after 1985 changed because when the NCP took over, they really decided that they were going to fight the the NCP. And John Gunnan talked about this a lot. He said that we are for a secular state. If you want to go to the mosque, you go to the mosque. You want to go to the church, you go to the church. But the SPLA is a movement and a, a movement and a revolution for all the people of Sudan and for a for how do you say this for a one Sudan, a new Sudan. And these are some of the things that historically, and one of the reasons people succeeded because as as we always say, the government and the Khartoum failed to make unity attractive. They failed to build roads, build infrastructure and projects. And most of the oil is coming from the South and you see Khartoum has all these resources. So they failed to deliver on that. And so these are things that they have to be taught with that. But now, how do you deal with the diaspora on topics of civic education? There are people who are born in Australia they never left. How do you educate them on South Sudan? One of the things is what you are doing now. Uh, one of the things is exactly what you are doing now. You know, if you if you are pay attention in the last, uh, from 2013, we have also produced another behavior. And that is the behavior of uh, yelling out without context of what you are saying. So. Where you, you can just, uh, when you decide uh, you don't want to verify any news, if you heard that Kira has done this, you don't want to verify where is the source of that information. And you have your microphone, you got your TV, you got your your webcam, you go to Clubhouse and then you make allegation and you believe in the allegation that is that, that you have made is verified by, by those who support you and they believe in now. And another thing that we have also developed within the last uh, 10 years is that uh, a self-appointed uh, supporter of any politician is dangerous than the politician because yes, what they are yes. spewing <laughs> what they are spewing out is more than is more dangerous to South, to South Sudan than, uh, than what the politicians say and the politician and then there is also another behavior also I call the same clubhouse uh, voices are more respected than journalists. Yeah. When they go to Juba, they are the ones that are, they are actually welcome at the airport. And then they are given cars and they will, they will do whatever they want. And that will tell you now, okay, what the politicians and the, and I, I have even, I even came across one segment where one of the loud, uh, voices even say i've just finished now talking with one of the highest I mean, uh, one of the highest official in the government and he's saying that the the last the last show that we have on uh, on clubhouse so and so was listening and he has appreciated me for the, he has appreciated us for the role that we have played i then said i then said okay okay if these politicians are listening to this betrothal voices, then what is the future of the country that they believe in? What is the future of the country? Also, their own legacy. Their own legacy. If they are going to leave, what will, be the, what will happen to their own legacy? How to combat that will be now bringing voices that are able to educate, have a conversation the way we have now. I don't think we have attacked anybody. And uh, we have not... Uh, we have not promoted any ideology that could be dangerous to individuals or groups. Also allowing experts, experts that are reading real stories. We, we have also experts that have uh, decided to read with one intention. They only read and study to quote 
what favor they say, not what favor they, the mm-hmm. masses. And these are the, the experts that uh, they are blocked their mind in a way that they don't want to be analytical with the situation. And the same experts, and this is one Australian told me that, that I have discovered South Sudan, give South Sudanese one argument for nine months and they will change their mind after the 10th month and ship to another one. <laughs> so, 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 so what we, what, what we need to understand now is that to educate, uh, is what you are doing and, uh, to educate also is to advocate to the government agencies. Allow experts, especially media experts, help, allow us to help you. It is not bad that if your ministries understand what, uh, what citizens want. Take example, the president. If the president is surrounded by a team of uh, media experts, I don't think they will be able to help him. In a way, take example, that we, we, we are doing podcasts now. Sitting around him, writing his own speech, let him record at his will at any time that he thinks. He did that. Produce it to the masses. You are able now to, to change the perception. If the president understands this, if, if he has to address the situation in a BA, if he has to under, uh, address the situation, you do that. You don't have to bring him on the TV. Give him the microphone wherever he is. Come and use that. Come and sit down as an expert. You are an audio editor. Edit that. And let the people get it. Go and play it on the TV as a grab. Then you, uh, the, the citizen will be informed. Uh, tell her the information. Not not coming to the TV and argue with us as a minister or as a as a as a official. You are coming to argue with us. You are also giving us information that will be verified within twenty four hours that you, that you have just lied, and you don't want to be told. But your, the video that you have even recorded will prove you down the line that you have actually lied. So so what we can do is the less educate. And then also within the journal, uh, journalist community, they must be, they must look at each other back. They don't need to be, they don't, they need to build uh, uh, a base where they are able to, to share ideas. And uh, even though they will have different angles when they are telling stories, there must be, I will give you an example here in Australia. When there is a, when one media house cover their story and they got it wrong, you are not uh, asked to directly criticize them. You are only asked to go and do the second story that will counter what they, what they have done. But you are not saying, you are not saying, oh, he has done it worse. He's the best, worst journalist and he's done. No, you're not destroying them, but try to give your audience the alternative the flavor that they miss from the other news. And and that's what we need to do as journalists as well. I think the biggest issue when we talk about the media, and I notice this from my side, I would say studies find that, I mean, sorry, I'm going back on my political analysis. But when you get the numbers, that's the job of an analysis. Whereas there's people who are sensationists who say things that provoke people. Uh, and the people, they bring on board also people who, are provocative. And you saw this when, uh, during the conflict, uh, I think a conflict, you say the, vi- the, I think you see the violence on social media, how people take it and say, this didn't happen. And the worst part is that when, when you get from any media, you learn that media doesn't challenge critical thinking and it doesn't make sense. It's just crazy because I think about how many of our people don't really want to be critical thinkers and the social media area kind of pushes them to do that. And it doesn't make sense. I will give you an example. Somebody called me and said, so your problem is that you bring our elders to your radio and you then start to interrogate them as if they are in the police station. And then I ask him, but <laughs> what, what, what is the role of the journalist? That is what we are. And then your, your main thing, you have only a simple objective. Listen to the question that the journalist is asking 
and listen to the to the answer that the politician or whoever being interviewed is going to give. Your role now is going to sit down and make a decision over that. And it is even the Dinka culture, I call, take example, or the South Sudanese culture. If a jack and a call fight, there is a Dinka concept that says, if a call talk first, please verify the story from a jack. Mm-hmm. That is the Dinka, that is the Dinka concept. It's not even, it's not only about media. It is the Dinka that, a eagle will in jam, nanera and a jam. That means you have talked until we listen to the other one. So mm. this is the concept that come to journalism. We tell people that okay take example during the war and that's what they were telling me oh there was coup why do you want to verify it anymore i said okay i need to verify it because it doesn't if it is said that that doesn't qualify that it was i am not saying that there was no coup but you have to qualify that this was the evidence and this is the evidence and when these evidence come together then we are the burden of proof we are proven to, to the world that okay it is true. And that's when I asked Riyamachar, Riyamachar was saying, I never participated in in a coup. I said, okay, but why did you win and announce the toppling of the government? If you were a victim, you would be better go and say, I am safe, but I was the target, but now I'm safe. But I don't know why did the government do this. Instead, you went and announced and you went to topple the government. That would warrant the, the suspicion that was a level on you. People could not even understand it. They're saying, no, you don't even ask the young machar and a simple question. He has no right to talk. And I say, no, you don't know what you are talking about. But even the media, you want your listeners or politicians to talk about American elections. And you have people who you'll be challenged. So when you're interviewed and you're questioned about something about the economy, they'll say, well, you made this statement on this date, January 2021. And you said one, two, three, four, five, when you were on the call. And this is the recording that the evidence that was right and you're wrong. And here's evidence to prove it. They don't want that. And uh, they don't want that. But uh, the, the worst part of it, coming back to the dice price, these are called the worst part of it is that the the worst critics that I came across are the people that live in the U.S., Australia, and Canada. Yes. These, these are the people that understand what is democracy. Because I came to discover one thing. You know, when I, when I interviewed these elders and I went to appreciate them, majority of them will say sometime, look, okay, I'm ready to talk. They have no problem. Whether they deny it or they accept it, they, they are free. They understand the idea of liberation. But if you go and pay attention, a close attention to the internet, the critics and, and the promoters of disunity within the South Sudanese societies are the people based in the West, majority of them. And then you ask yourself, what is wrong with these people? They are in the comfort of their own homes. They have lights. They have water. They have children that are being taken to school. They have the welfare system. And they don't want the same thing to the people of South Sudan. That's why they are anti-journalists. That's why they are anti-analysts. Another thing, somebody who has never worked here will then go to South Sudan and say that, I'm going to change South Sudan. What skill are you taking to South Sudan? If you cannot be self-employed, <laughs> if you cannot be self-employed, you cannot be of any help, but you want to be a politician. I have also been part of many... South Sudanese group, WhatsApp or other group. And what shocked me is that nobody is interested in an analytical debate. Somebody always have somebody to blame. When you blame Kir, that is the best comment will come in. When you blame whoever it, but when you're trying to analyze, another issue that we are uh, we are not pl- paying close attention is these are called. And I did a Dinka analysis yesterday, or was it yeah the, yesterday in in language? I was saying if Kir is to be blamed for fifty percent, who will be blamed for the other fifty percent of uh, failure? Number one, is Kir responsible for those putting borders, the the checkpoints between villages? No. Is Kir responsible for a policeman that has been taken to the training and came back not to understand his role that he is there to impose law and to protect citizens? Is that responsibility of President Kir? It is the responsibility of the director or whoever responsible of that unit. Can we talk to that unit and tell this man be responsible? The Minister of Interior, what is he telling those who fall under his responsibility? In the Western world, when you are given responsibility or in any government, you are implementing the policies of the president. You are not inventing your own. Yes, you're implementing the policies of the president. If the president has said, we have now signed peace agreement with
with the opposition. And we need South Sudan to be a free South Sudan. Go and implement that. Let the president tell you, no, 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 no. That's not what I was telling you. And you will terminate your service. Then you will say, at least Banya, I was doing your work. But then you contradicted yourself, I will have to leave. But that is not the case in Universal Sudan. In Universal Sudan, somebody is going to invent his own uh, way of doing things because he need to be powerful to work on. That was the concept during the SPLA because I, I'll give you an example. In, in 1996, I own a castle radio and a small national Panasonic. Somebody was agitated by that. He's a soldier. He's an SPLA soldier. He came and said, I said, yes. I'm a So who? <laughs> and I'm a tiba, So I, I have to st- stand by attention. And he asked me, in the crowd, come to Bull. I said, my no, I don't have any star or even I don't have any run. KV and Tukun in the radio. Why would you have a radio? <laughs> <laughs> he is entitled. He's a David with SPLA. He, oh, David with SPLA. He's a David with SPLA and I should not have a prestigious life than him. The guy went to beat me up. That was one. I was beaten because I have not given somebody antibiotic. I was badly bushed. I was badly tortured. And then that concept is what is now being taken to the nation building. And so people are actually copying some behavior that are not supposed to be part of the South Sudan. In South Sudan that we are in now, we were talking with you before about the diversity of the Dinka. The Dinka don't even know themselves that much, leave alone other tribes. So what South Sudanese need to do as part of the civic education is actually teaching themselves the, the, who are the laws, the laws tribe. What is their way of life? What do they respect? Take example, you go to Anywa in you know, Otalo. You cannot just walk to the, to, the, to the house of a king, whether you are a big officer or where you cannot just work with your shoes there. You will, will be violating some cultural practices. Any other thing I need to know that. Because if you go to this place and go and tamper with that, you will be disrespecting those cultures. Or And, and these are the things that people of South Sudan need to understand that their diversity as a multicultural society need to be taught. People need to talk to themselves. The Zande have a rich culture. The Dinka of different uh, uh, regions have their own different cultures. They have taboos. They have uh, cultures that they they respect. And if you don't know about it, how do we have a nation? And and that is the perception that is, you know, we are trying to deploy the mentality of Trabi. Good enough, I met Trabi. I met Trabi in... Really? Uh, yeah, I met Trabi in 2011 when he came for the uh, independence. He, he was in Juba. He came to celebrate the independence of South Sudan. Him and Saadi Galmadi, they actually came Really? Yes, they were there in Juba. I have a photo of him with me. Actually, he's standing with me. And I went and, because knowing, uh, having read much about him, I went and met him and said, Dr. Travi, how are you? And he said, ha, 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 congratulations, <laughs> young man. <laughs> so, and, and, and I was looking. Now, 10 years later, and we mess ourselves up, I was saying, is this what was in this man's mind? When he was telling me, congratulations. And knowing that he was saying many years back, he quoted that the Nilotic will mess the, the independent South. And you cannot say that he was wrong. We are the problem now. And we are taking tribal problem in a way, in a way that that not, does not even benefit the tribes. So finding a reason now to, to develop the love of nation that was developed during the SPLA, SPLM. I'm telling you, a call is going to be tough to find yeah, young people coming together with one ideology of being uh, nationalistic about their country, being patriotic about their country, singing songs. Because in our Jechamer, you care less about who you are with. You are just South Sudanese. He, and and have we, if we were not South Sudanese, some of us would have not survived. When we were young, I went to Equatoria when I was 11. We were traveling the bushes of Acholi, the Lotuko, the Kakwa, the Lulubo, the Mahdi. And I'm telling you, a South Sudanese a Mahdi, I will give you a story. In 1992, when the people of Bor moved to Ameh, there was a very serious case of uh, malnutrition. Mm-hmm. We have to go into the village of the Mahdi to go and look for Bambe and Babra, the cassavas. Wow. And these people were able to feed us. I remember we went to, when we were going to Kejekeji, I have an empty gallon. I went to go and cut them for my car to play as a, as a young person. But when we went to Kejekeji, we ran out of food. I went to one of the villages and I went and said, look, I want to sell this empty gallon for Bambe. The, the sweet yam. We were, I was given two buckets full of yams. And I'm telling you that save our family from that. These were the Equatorians. These were the Equatorians. The Equatorians have never hated Dinka. The people of Bor would have not, the people of Bor would have not survived 1992, 93, 94. They were not coerced by the SPLA. They were receptive. 
they have treated us well. So when somebody come out and think that now, you take example, you find a thing and say, oh, Equatorian are bad. Or they, 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 no, they have never been like. So we need to ask ourselves what is changing people in 2020, in 2013. We have to understand that these were not the people that were like that during the liberation. Something is changing. Situations are changing. Something is changing. And also when you are not telling positive stories, you are not telling an, a young Equatorian at the age of uh, a call, understand nothing that there is something good the, the people of Dinka knows about their tribe. They will think that no, the Dinka hate us. No, they don't. I think also... The Dinka, I'll give you an example. I was at a function and then somebody came up to me and from Bari and said something about land grabbing and pointed at me, said, you Denka, you need to stop doing this. I said, do you even know where I'm from? I'm from the border. I'm from the most northern community. It's like people don't know each other. People don't know like, yes, I am a Denka, but I my, my community, the most northern community, we don't have a border with Equatoria. We're in the border with Sudan. So it's like... If you break down, people need to break things down to local issues. And I tell them, you know, we have to break it down and look at things from a local issue because now you have somebody who wants to sympathize with the cause because it supports their ethnicity. Like I could be a Dank and there could be something that's happening in Equatoria because I'm Danka, but no, there's local issues there. And some th- things may not concern me. It may not concern me as somebody from Rang, the northern part of South Sudan. You you don't blame them because I've been listening to Clubhouse and uh, now TikTok. And there is an ideology that, that has been created by these vocal supporters of the regime in Juba. They have created an ideology thinking that, you know, this ideology of supremacy. So mm-hmm. there are people who will say, we, the Dinka, the government of the Dinka. And then you say, no, it's not a government of a Dinka. It's the government, even the, the family of Selva Kirmayadi in his village, I don't think that they are getting what, uh, what Kirmayadi is getting. Don't combine, uh, don't call government a government of Dinka. It is a government of the elites. And the elites mm-hmm. are different groups. And if you look at the, the most disadvantaged communities in the whole South Sudan, the Dinka community is very, very underdeveloped. Whether you're going to Ruweng, whether you're going to Rang, whether you're going to Akon, where Kirmayadi come from, whether you go to Malual. I have covered the stories. It was just until recently that peace started to come to Lake State. Lakes was not that peaceful. You go to Bor. Bor, actually, people are not living in the villages when the SPLA started. The villages that when uh, when the SPLA started in 1983, majority of those villages have been abandoned, and it is a bush. You go to the village of John Garang, now flooded for the last few years, and uh, no development in his own village. Go to the village of Kualmanyang, no development. The flood also came to his home village, No, no, nothing in, in his village. So... Go to the village of Salvakir and the village of other generals. If people have built good houses in, in Tongping or in uh, Jabal, it doesn't qualify that they, they, have actually, they are actually doing the same thing to the people in their villages. I was telling somebody, look at the, the power of uh, Atar, the Adinka. What are they getting? Mm. What are they getting from uh, Jongle government or what are they get, getting from South Sudan government? It doesn't mean that if people like Gier or the rest of the people are happy, or Kualmanyang or whoever, or Kirmayadid is happy. It doesn't mean that the Dinka are happy somewhere. This is one thing that such breakdown has to be done. Who knows? And just like that, but winding down, I want to close. I will ask you questions. The questions of, of how has your work made South Sudan a better place? And we talk about people doing impact and people don't believe that you can go home and you can make a small change. Sometimes you don't have to make the big thing. How does your work make South Sudan a better place? Let me tell you a story. You know, if you listen to the stories of the liberators, uh, one of the people, I will call uh, one of the people is himself, Salfa Mayari, and uh, Dr. John Garangdamabir. If I put politics aside and ask a simple question, these are the people that joined the movement at a very young age. Kirmayadi left school because he wanted to liberate the people of South Sudan. That means he has an intention to change something. Mm-hmm. Dr. John Garang de Mabir went to America in 1960s. At a time, he would have refused after graduating from uh, Iowa State University. He would have just said, look, I'm not going back. I have to live a good life. Look for a, a rural village in uh, Iowa. Build myself a house, marry a, a wealthy white girl. But what he, he decided to say, look, I have to be an agent of change. At a very young age, in 1972, he opposed the peace agreement in uh, Addis Ababa. And his basis for argument was that the peace that we are going to be part of, there is no guarantee 
it is going to be abrogated by the northern regime. And that's why he argued during the peace agreement that SPLA must exist without being integrated in order to safeguard the, uh, the peace agreement. This brings us now back to your question. Can anybody be an agent of change? Yes. If these young people, they don't have plane to travel with, they don't have cars, they don't have bicycle, but they work, they, they could trek up to Ethiopia. Some of them would trek up to Congo. Dr. John Garang, they were surviving with what they called Tumuni, 50 cents of Kenyan chilling in 1965 when they went to Kenya. They suffered. And this is the man that was supposed to go and say, no, look, I have suffered. I cannot go back to that dirty place. He came back and the man died without getting the money that he was supposed to get. So if you look at the younger generation, from uh, a call to any other young person that may listen to this podcast. There are three things that we have to do to change. Number one, we have finished learning technical skills from the universities. You are a political scientist. I am a journalist, but at the same time, an IT person. But why do I love talking about South Sudanese issues? Because I want to leave a country where my children can say, at least we belong somewhere. You have gone back now. You have also done what John Graham would have did. You went back. You can survive in the U.S. You speak the language. You understand the, the, the area. You understand the, the values of the Western world. You can work for any senator in the U.S. You can be paid thousands of dollars. But you choose to go where, where you don't have air conditioners at a time, fuel at a time. But what do you want? You want to be an agent of change. And this is where young people, young South Sudanese people need now to talk to people that can mentor them and let them also understand the, the dynamics of each story. Let them not be the, be uh, fanatics without listening to, to real issues. Otherwise, they will have no country that they are proud of. South Sudan is fragile at a tribal level, is tr- fragile at a, a regional level, is fragile at any level. Any mistakes that you do, this country can exactly d- disintegrate the, the way we separate from the North. So what am I trying to say to you, to me, and any other person? Engage with the like mind. Bring people that you think that will have a message to change something. And also know that the microphone that you have now is a bomb. If you bring a, a little person who don't understand anything, but he can open his mouth, he will say whatever you want to say. You will be left with stress, and the audience that you want to save will, will be stressed too because he come with the intention to destroy. These are the people that you have to be very cautious with and say, no, 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 no. I know. Take your platform. Do it. And that's why, and that's what I've done over years. That's the experience you can take from me. I said, look, if you are not being logical, I am not bringing you. You can have thousands or millions of followers, but I don't think I can value your ideas because your ideas are dangerous. We cannot succeed as one tribe. Whether Dinka is 4 million people, Dinka doesn't have a power over a, a small tribe like called Tanen that is only less than 10,000 people. The all equivalent in, 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 in the face of South Sudan. That a small tribe can produce leaders. So make use of uh, your platform and also add your uh, commentary in, in the Western world as well. Uh, South Sudan is the least known country and misrepresented at, the, at every document that you find or whether you're looking at the majority of the Western media. So there is a need actually to, to find a way to project South Sudan uh, positive stories. Every now and then it is about killing a uh, humanitarian crisis and also bad things happening. But we got good stories. We are philosophers. We got a good land. We, we are 11 million, 12 million people in a big land. And we also need to educate our people. You are from the U.S. Especially the role of multinational companies. Is South Sudan going to survive in the hands of the rogue uh, billionaires that have money that they have nothing to do with? What if they come with that money to South Sudan, take the agricultural land of Iran, where they know that there is a loophole, there is, a, there is no legal framework that can protect that. If they come and give uh, somebody $10,000 and then sign a 99-year uh, lease agreement because they know that there is, a, there is a, a legal loophole, will you fight back? People need to be, under, uh, to be trained. People need to be taught about the importance of the land the the importance of also just knowing that you can just putting your signature into something that you have not read can sell South Sudan out. That will be my last message. Thank you so much. This was a great discussion. You guys will have the link to follow Ajak. He has his own podcast, which is set and I'll be on hopefully. He's also on social media where uh, you can follow his work. If you want culture, cultural dancing, language, follow him on Facebook. He's also a 
photographer. He posted some pictures, uh, and he has, uh, he has a lot of pictures of history. Thank you, guys. See you next time.